What's going on, you violent freaking creatures? Will with Gutter Fighting Secrets. Today we're going to be talking about choosing the right martial arts academy, gym, dojo, whatever you want to call it. There is a, a list I have of things that you want to look for, things you want to look out for. I've been doing this for 18 years. I've traveled around to gyms and schools throughout the country and around the world as well. I have trained in over a dozen systems, like dedicatedly, if that's a word. And I've compiled a lot of things that I personally look for when I'm looking to train at a new place. When I move to a new state, I always go through this kind of like period of trying to suss out who's who and talking to people that I'm contacted with, you know, and, and this and that. But not everybody has like contacts in the martial arts world and this and that that can help them out like that. So what I intend to do is give you a list of things, like I said, to look for and a list of things to definitely, free, definitely freaking look out for. Because unfortunately, there's a lot of like freaking scumbags in this world. You know, you, you don't have any specific qualifications to teach martial arts, except that you're good at violence. And a lot of the times that um, that comes with people having sort of a criminal-esque mentality. And there's a lot of hustlers out there and there's a lot of people who just want your freaking money. We're going to talk about all this. So we got to figure out a system, if you will, a way to look out and like identify the red flags that can certainly be there that some people will overlook. So whether you are getting into a new dojo, um, whether you're just getting into martial arts in general and hand-to-hand -hand combat, whether you are, whatever your situation is, maybe you're a guest in town. This happens to me frequently where I'm staying somewhere for a, a number of days or weeks and I want to go and train somewhere and I'm a guest at the gym and it's given me a good, um, a very good kind of outlook on like a lot of what, again, what to look out for and and then what to really look for in a teacher as well as uh, a system, a system of hand-to-hand -hand combat. So we're going to jump into it, guys. I hope you enjoy. In fact, I freaking know you will enjoy. Don't forget to check out our website, go to fightingsecrets.com. All right, guys, ready? Freaking ready? Are you freaking ready? Let's do it. So after nearly two decades practicing martial arts, seriously studying over a dozen different systems and being a guest in more dojos across the country, actually across the world that I can count. I've come up with a list of certain things to look for and look out for. Uh, we're going to go over those and I'm going to start with the things that I think are the most important to look for in a teacher and also in a system. So in no particular order, I'm going to go for this, but the most important thing, in my opinion, and this isn't just my opinion, I'll get into that, is combat experience. The most important thing to look for in a teacher, as well as a system, is combat experience. Does the system have a combat legacy? Does the system actually have a history of being used in war, in different operations in different situations where it's like relevant and particularly relevant to like modern history like karate has a history of like warfare in ancient japan <laughs> taekwondo has a history of relevancy in like ancient korean warfare ancient right but is it is it relevant to today I mean, some could argue definitely freaking not. I'd probably be one of those people. Number two, the teacher. Does he or she have combat experience? Now, this doesn't necessarily mean are they a combat veteran in Iraq or Afghanistan or some war theater, because that honestly doesn't necessarily translate over hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. I think we all know that. Just because you were you know, in Iraq and maybe you have like a combat service ribbon or whatever because you got like some mortars went overhead or whatever, but you were a mechanic. That doesn't mean you know anything about teaching combat. Also, and I know, you know, some of my friends that are helped with this channel who are, you know, combat, like some real combat vets who've seen some shit and gone through some doors, they'll tell you that doesn't necessarily equate to teaching hand-to-hand -hand combat either. Now, does it give you that mental fortitude, that mental toughness to like 
kind of put the pieces together a little bit more, yes, but it doesn't equate to hand-to-hand -hand combat experience. So what I want you to look for in a teacher is hand-to-hand -hand combat experience. Now, that doesn't have to be, again, in Fallujah, stabbing terrorists in the neck, all right? And it doesn't have to even necessarily be like killing motherfuckers with, you know, whatever. It could be cage fighting. It could be street fighting. It could be, did they grow up, you know, doing some dirt? Did they... <laughs> Did they fight a lot in the cage? Did they, are they a Muay Thai fighter? Have they had several Muay Thai fights? Um, you know, even, um, even just a jujitsu guy who's done a lot of grappling tournaments, that's combat experience. That's real world experience. All right. Um, police officers, but again, that doesn't necessarily translate over to combat experience because a lot of cops are fucking pussies. We know this well, who don't know how to fight. So you know, a cop like Bill Wolf, for example, who like, is crazy in the head and he went out there looking for fights and gotten them. Yeah, that type of guy, like somebody who's been there and, and had combat experience. And you will be able to tell when you talk to these guys, like who's kind of who's bullshitting and, and who's not, because they'll explain violence in a different way. You know, was it Richie? It was Richie from Street Fight Secrets. British cat. You guys probably so probably some of you guys definitely know him and have studied his stuff but he has a saying is that and i agree with this fullheartedly that you'll always know a guy when he's had like definite experience where he explains it like this all right you go up to the guy you grab him by the shirt you bang him in the nose <laughs> versus somebody who's going to say all right establish a good grip you know you're going to want to twist and then you're going to want to close your fist and execute a straight punch directly at the individual's face like that's two totally different ways of like explaining it. One guy's definitely had simple violent experience and he's equating it to just a very simple, it's a simple technique, grab a shirt and fucking punch him in the face versus somebody who says, oh, you know, do this and do that and do this and do that very mechanical way of breaking it down. You want to look for the, the first and not the latter. Somebody who has like definite, fairly credible combat. Shut up. I'm talking here. I'm talking. Somebody who has, I knew they'd listen, definite combat experience in some respect, you know, again, either sports, cage, prize fighting, whatever, competitions, whatever, or legitimate combat street experience or, or both better yet. Number two is going to be a good attitude. Somebody who like wants to be there, somebody who wants to be teaching this stuff and legitimately like enjoys it. Not only do they enjoy fighting and the martial arts, right? But they also enjoy teaching it and sharing it with others. Because again, there are people out there who, this is their job. This is how they bring in money. Like maybe this is kind of the last resort for them or like they're washed up. Maybe they're a felon and they can't really make money elsewhere, whatever. Or like there are people like that out there where it's like, they're not really into it. Their heart's not in it. But you want to find somebody who, their heart is in it. Like you can tell when you speak with them that their eyes light up and they're passionate about like sharing this technique with you because they want you to master this technique as well. Like there are some instructors when they show you something, you can just, you can tell that it's like, I'm so excited to show you this because you can fucking hurt somebody this way. And like, yeah, that's like really different than somebody showing you something. And he's like, all right, like, you know, 25 arm bars from guard, you know, all right, go ahead, do it. And then he like scrolls on his phone and doesn't even like watch you when you do it to make sure you're doing correct. That's the type of guy you want to avoid. He's burnt out. He's not loving what he does. And he's probably towards, you know, not a great point in his career. Whereas somebody who's maybe, you know, maybe he has been doing it for a long time, but he's not burnt out because he likes what he does and he wants to show it to you. He gets excited about it. That's a good attitude to have. And he's friendly about it. But number three, somebody who enforces or instills not enforces that's a bad word but instills discipline into their students especially whilst they are drilling right so like my biggest beef with any school i go to whether i'm a visitor or a student is if while you're training people are talking about nonsense and people who stop drilling in the middle of like training really 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 irked me because it's not a social club. You're not there to socialize. Socializing can come after if you guys want to hang out afterwards, if you guys want to get a group together and go to the bar or whatever afterwards. 
awesome. I freaking highly encourage that. Camaraderie is part of why we train. It's part of why any young man or woman, you know, frankly, goes to war, if you can say, or, or you know, trains for war. Camaraderie, it's a big part of it. But while you're training, look, take it seriously. You're not there training to, like, paint pictures. You're there training to kill people. You have to keep that in your mind is while you're there, you're, you're, you're training because your life very well could depend on it. And even if you're not like in the military, even if you're not a bodyguard or whatever other reason you could have for a drug dealer <laughs> for training hand to hand combat, like your life very well at some point, like may depend on it. You're, you're there for a reason. And that should be in the back of your mind. If you're practicing to kill people with your hands. That's what mar that's what real martial arts is. That's what real real war arts are, right? You're training to disable somebody with your hands. So that needs to be top priority in your mind. And like whenever I go into a school, and this happens fucking almost every time I'm in a school, there's only a few places I've ever been to where it's very serious during training. One of those places is AMA Fight Club, where I came up, where I learned, you know, MMA, jujitsu, Muay Thai, all of that, wrestling. Uh, you know, to some degree too. That place, Professor John Helwig, very disciplined dude. All right. He grew up doing um fuck, now I forget the name of it, but it's this old Korean art when, you know, very disciplined. His teacher was very disciplined. And he transitioned from this cooperative martial arts style. Check out the podcast where I've had him on. He explains it a lot better. But um he came up doing that. And he translated that discipline over to his jujitsu school when he started teaching. And that's something that will always stay with me forever and ever. That translated into students becoming highly proficient at a very quick clip, at a very fast rate. You know, he didn't let you talk while you were on the mat. While you were drilling, you were allowed to do one thing that was drill. If you got hurt on the mat, there was no cursing allowed. Like I legit have had my rib like really like um I guess it was dislocated. I don't know, whatever. I was in a lot of pain. And I go, fuck, ah, and I'm holding and I'm fucking on the floor like this, right? And he comes over and he goes, No cursing on the mat. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I just got seriously hurt. He's like, all right, but no cursing on the mat. And I'm, that's happened to me frequently, where like I'm literally like I've had a 250-pound man laying on my ribs after that happened. And, oh fuck. He goes, no cursing on the mat. Like, legit, that's very serious right there. And that's exactly the type of thing that you want. But after class, it was all like, ah, oh, man, how you doing? How was your weekend, bro? Like, let's, you know, let's talk about this fight that happened and this and that. Like, really good camaraderie after class, all right? And I didn't mean to go on a tangent there, but number three is really you have to look for a disciplined academy, but camaraderie and stuff afterwards. Don't talk on the mat don't freaking stop training because you want to talk about you know how hot sally is those yoga pants over there on her it look really hot like leave that for later don't look at sally you could look at sally's ass but don't talk about it with your friend while you're drilling um an instructor who will instill that discipline on you and make you tougher right like while you're in class um it's very good for your instructor to want to push you to a certain degree to get better. And if that's, you know, you, while you guys are warming up, he's got you like dragging people across the floor and making you actually sweat and have your heart rate go up really a lot before you start drilling to make sure you're really tired when you're drilling so that if you ever need to get into a fight and your adrenaline spikes, you can actually execute these techniques. That's exactly what he's doing. And that's why, and that's why he's being hard on you to instill discipline and to make sure that you are able to actually uh, successfully win a legitimate life and death altercation. Um, a teacher that will instill discipline into you while you are training is very important. But then once the training is over, you don't want that discipline to like transfer over, right? You don't want to be in some cult where it's like every time you see your instructor, it's, you know, whatever, right? Um, that type of, Cobra Khan or, or Cobra Kai or whatever from the Karate Kid where it's, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, 
it's got a time and a place, but after the training is finished and before the training starts, that shouldn't be the case. It should be, it should be a friendly, good atmosphere and environment, which leads me to number four is a good atmosphere and environment. So some schools you walk into and everyone's like there, they've got like uh, something to prove. Like, and I've, I've trained for a while at a school that was like that. It was an MMA school where people were legit out to hurt you. Um, and they all had this complex of like, I'm here so I can learn how to fucking do a cage fight and win a cage fight. Or like, I'm here to like, like prove my dominance over all these other guys. That's not, that's kind of a toxic environment, you know, like, so it's really a fine mix of people who are there to train and become better and better themselves and better their skills and abilities as a warrior, but not to the degree that they want to hurt other people or conquer other people. Those same people that, and this comes down to the instructor, needs to have the ability to kind of cull that and make sure that there is a line between people who want to get better, and but those same people also want to help other people get better. And if that means that you need to kind of tone it back for a new guy that comes in and be friendly to him and say like, all right, man, like, this is how it works. This is what we're doing. You know, like no worries, just take it easy. We don't have to fight each other like that versus some asshole who a new guy comes in. He's like, good. Another person to display my dominance on come here. Like that's, that's not healthy in any way. And that, that will ultimately lead to a very low attendance rate and ultimately probably a closing of that school eventually. Um, or just a, a school with a bad reputation. And if you don't see a lot of students in that school, like on a fairly consistent basis, well, there's a reason why. So a good attitude of, of the students and instructor or instructors are is crucial, um, but it has to be balanced. So attention to detail, that's number five. Okay, number five is going to be attention to detail by the instructor. So again, I've been to schools where the instructor is pretty loosey-goosey about things and he's explaining things, but not really that well. And then I've been to schools, again, AMA Fight Club, where I came up, my instructor, Helwig, John Helwig, he, Professor John Helwig, that is, he was a master, is a master of explaining things in such detail that it, like, just makes sense to fucking anybody. And this is an art. This is using your words um, coherently and eloquently to get a point across, Um analogies are good allegories are good jokes are good and they have their time and place but somebody who can put that all together into a package and make it translatable to like for like the new guy or the guy who's been there for six months or the guy who's been there for 10 years like anybody should be able to understand the techniques that he is showing you and especially in systems like jujitsu where the, the the techniques are incredibly complicated and it takes years of repetition to really like learn them it's imperative, in freak imperative that your teacher explains it well. Um, if they're just, and some teachers, it's not their fault, like they're good people, but they don't know how to explain it well. They just don't. And, and it's it's so second nature for them that they take it for granted that not everybody's on the same page. And I've, I've also been to schools where like, they'll, they'll say, they'll say like, oh, you guys remember this technique? Well, you know, that's, you know, if we're doing that, then we just do this, this, and this. Well, it's like not everybody here learned that technique. Not everybody here has been here for three years the last time you showed that, right? Like not everybody comes every single day. So you got to remember that like, no, we don't know this technique. Don't like assume that everybody knows it, okay? Explain this technique and why that translates over to this one, all right? And even if everybody has learned this one technique, well, um, to re-explain it is good for the learning process. So go over that and then re-explain why it translates in over that. Um, and then a lot of times teachers will kind of like, they'll, uh, they'll show stuff that they're comfortable with, right? Everybody does this, but some teachers will show like a lot of like upside down, inverted guard, back flip, freaking crazy feet. But like, you, you got to realize not everybody's dexterous like that, right? Not everybody's good at that stuff so to be able to show techniques that will work for everybody and not just somebody who's super athletic or not just somebody who's super strong or not just somebody who's been doing martial arts for a long time you want to make sure that the instructor is um really paying attention to detail for all his all all of his students 
you know, and not just showing like, and not assuming everybody's like been doing jujitsu for 10 years or Krav Maga for 10 years or Kali for whatever, right? Whatever the case, you can't assume anything, re-explain it. It's good for the learning process. And if your instructor is doing that, then you're, you're on the right track. Okay. So, um, you want to make sure that the students are competent. This is number six. Make sure that the students are competent in what they're doing. And if you're a lot of the times, you know, when you go into a new school and you're a new guy, even if you tell them, oh, I have experience, they're going to pair you up with a student who's been there for a long time. And that student is going to teach you, right? They're, the instructor will show the technique. Let's use an example. This is an overhead block, you know, and then it's going to translate into a, a palm strike to the, to the face. Okay, let's just use that simple fucking example. World War II combatants, right? Overhead block translates and then a palm strike. So the instructor will show that and then he'll pair the new guy with like an advanced student. So that advanced student can break it down for them Vardy style. Very common thing to happen. If that student is struggling to show you the techniques, if that student, if you feel like they don't really understand what they're doing or how they're teaching, you know, how they're teaching is one thing, but if you can tell that they don't really have an understanding of how to fight, well, you got to think like, that guy's been there for six years and he still doesn't really know how to fight or he still doesn't understand violence in this certain way. He's not clearly been in a lot of sparring matches. That's a big red flag right there. So you want to make sure that, you know, the students that have been there for a while are actually learning and they're becoming better martial artists and better warriors. And if they have an understanding of, you know, warrior philosophy and warrior ethos and how to pull off these techniques actually correctly, and they can show it to you. That's a huge green flag. You want to really, you know, give that school a chance. If the students, and I'm going to run through this list again, if the students are competent, okay, if there is discipline while, while learning and drilling, but a good atmosphere kind of before and after, if the teacher has the ability to break down the techniques and teach them well and has attention to detail for all parties involved, if the students, uh, students and the teacher both have a good attitude and you can tell the teacher's excited to teach this stuff. And if they have combat experience, well, that's a big green flag. You should really think about, you know, kind of sticking around this place and seeing what they're all about. So that's six things right there that I really think are super, super important. I'm not going to think make it a top 10 list because that would just take all day. And I don't want to waste your time and certainly not mine. So I'm going to leave it at those six things. And now we're going to be talking about things to look out for, and big red flags in a training academy, gym, dojo, whatever you want to call it. But that's going to have to wait till the next video because I'm running out of time here. This video is already like 22 minutes long and I don't want to make it any longer because you won't watch it. And I want this stuff to sink in and it's important shit. I'll see you on the next video and we're going to be throwing your way, the red flags, what to look out for when it comes to training at a new academy. Until next time, please remember that you are your first and last line of defense. Train hard, stay safe, and I was going to say stay hard, but that's not my line. Stay ready for the fucking action, boys. All right, I'll see you next time. Cheers.